gamers, welcome back to another episode of the Cuddle Punk Podcast. I am your host, the mastermind, Veronica Vexed, with us this week. They are undisputed Chicago Hyper Pop Cyber Grind royalty. Coco Joey's here, everybody. Coco Joey, how are you doing today? I'm here. I'm doing well. It's such a beautiful day outside, so it's like hard for me to be anything but. We're recording this on not only the first like super warm day in the city of Chicago, but also during the day of the eclipse. So if you see any cosmic nonsense happening, please make sure to let us know in the comments. <laughs> Yes, I went to the beach with a couple of friends and watched the eclipse with my very ridiculous looking cardboard filtered glasses and such a beautiful day. I was watching WrestleMania all weekend uh, at one of my partner's place with a bunch of people. And then today the eclipse happened, obviously. It's been just like a full like couple day sprint of like enjoying one huge event that doesn't happen very often with a bunch of people like just all over the world it's been a it's been a big weekend of collectiveness over at yeah. the cuddle punk house yeah same here i went to one two three like four shows over the weekend so you were busy this weekend in terms of shows <laughs> similar collective uh energy so yeah i feel you i don't know anything about wrestling to be honest so I don't, is that like we'll we'll talk in the dms we'll change that at some point now this week was the um this week was WrestleMania, which is like the big the biggest WWE thing of the okay. year, and a uh, title reign that had lasted over three years finally got ended. Um, wow. So yeah, I had spent the previous three WrestleManias being exasperated by this particular person retaining the championship, and then last night it fi after three fucking years it finally ended. It was it was so good to just be with people and being able to experience that moment. It was. Chef's kiss. So wait, a dumb question. I know you're interviewing me here, but I'm curious. Is that Please all? keep by, going. Is that all by design or? Because yes. like so. <laughs> no, go ahead. It, keep keep your question going. <laughs> I was just gonna say, isn't it all by design? Like, don't they decide like you know the moves that they're gonna do and like the victors and? I mean, they decide. Yes, of course. Like, yeah, wrestling is like wrestling is scripted. They know who's gonna win usually like months in advance like they've predict they've already planned out who's going to win and everything but it's not about like whether or not you know if they're winning or anything like i come to wrestling as like a theater thing like it is it is the ultimate form of theater it is the ultimate soap opera that you get no to doubt. see played out for years and years and years and it's the best shit oh, ever yeah i'm I'm amazed when i whenever i see clips or like the, the moves that can be done it's it's the best shit ever let's get into some more of the questions yeah. Um, I want to start just by asking you, I don't know too much about your, like the beginnings of your musical journey. Let's start off there. What's got you into music in the first place and how did you end up getting to the point where you're making the stuff that you're making right now? Yeah. So my, my whole life has kind of been a long musical journey, um, for me to get where I'm at right now. Um, I first started taking piano lessons when I was four. Um, so that was kind of like the the genesis of my music making. Um, my older brother played piano. He's four years older than me. So anything he did, I thought was like super cool. And I had to do that too. So I wanted to start taking lessons. And then what got me into listening to music um, and just being passionate about like bands and such uh, was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. I think many people can uh, relate to that experience. Um, yeah. Oh, I see back we got there. It right yeah. in the background right here. <laughs> The one and two re remake. Um, I, that's the only ones that I've played, but I played the shit out of that, both on Xbox and Switch. I played the shit out of the one and two remake. Nice, nice. Yeah, I. that is so funny to me because it's like when I play the one and two remake, I'm like, yeah, this is like what it always looked like, right? Because like you always like remember like how good it looked in the past. And then you see like the footage from like the actual games that you're playing and you're like, oh, Fuck, that looks terrible but where did I mean, all these polygons come from i know right right i mean you know great for the time um but yeah so playing tony hawk i used to like run my character into a corner so that the music would just play and i had like a fisher price tape recorder and i would just like record the music and like make mixtapes for myself that consisted of the tony hawk's pro skater soundtrack and then also like back in the day on um on, like the early days of amazon they had like 30 second samples of like the songs on the CDs. And so I would just like record the 30 second samples and like make mixtapes of that. So that was kind of like my, my earliest uh, memories getting into music. Um, and then just like, 
I wrote a lot of piano music when I was a kid, um, being a piano player, which then kind of translated into writing songs on GarageBand. I had like my first sort of solo efforts on GarageBand in middle school. I was making black metal, which is kind of a funny genre to be experimenting with in your first recordings, I think, because it's like, it's supposed to sound bad. So you're it, jumping it like, right into the pit uh, of discourse uh, right at the beginning of your career. That's, yeah. that's impressive. That takes balls. So it, it like sounded terrible, but I mean, that's kind of like the vibe. So it, you know, I, I, I look back on those recordings fondly as a funny way to just remember what I did, but I don't think they're like of any quality or anything, but then like high school playing in bands, I uh, went to school for music composition and like briefly wanted to be a classical composer, which did not last long once I left school and decided I didn't want to go on past my undergraduate degree. Um, and so then since then it's just been like existing in the Chicago music scene and playing in bands and then had kind of a spiritual transformation of sorts during COVID. Um, and then after that kind of like refocused my intentions on like what I wanted to do as far as my music making was concerned, what I wanted to bring into the world through that, which then kind of in a roundabout way led to the Coco Joy project. And then sonically that this project kind of incorporates like the sounds of all the bands that I played in, like the artists that I collaborated with over the years producing all the way back to like the first record that I actually bought was uh, Aqua Aquarium. So I feel like I'm kind of like accessing like all, all that stuff. So it just kind of is like this big blender in my mind that has resulted in Coco Joey. And then I, I made the record and discovered a whole lot of beautiful musicians uh, in the cyber grind universe um, and kind of befriended everybody through that. And now I'm here. I know how important the community that you have, that you've built in like that kind of like cyber grind, hyper poppy, just kind of like, let's be real with it. Just that very, very trans group of like Midwest musicians with like, Anita, Kitty Litter, and like Saru, I'm a no hitter, and Blind Equation, and all of them. Like, it's very clear that that community is one of the most important parts of the music that you make. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, one of my shifts, as far as like music making was concerned, especially in starting the Coco Joy project, was like finding like-minded people and friends and community through the music, rather than having it be just like a pure expression of the ego, which I think like it kind of has to be on some level because I'm writing music from my brain um, about my experiences. But yeah, and it, it's kind of amazing because I feel like the the record that I last put out, Coco Joy's World, is like the most open and vulnerable expression of myself that I had put into my music ever. Um, and so it was really cool to have the experience of like finding this community in Chicago after making the record. Just sort of like putting my truest self out there and then having uh, that response. So yeah, I don't know, the, the scene in Chicago is amazing. Um, I love, you know, how often everybody's going to everybody else's shows and playing shows together. That's all fantastic. If you don't mind, we don't have to get into it like super deep or anything. I am curious about the like spiritual reconstruction that you were talking about going into the creation of the Coco Joey project and into like your reemergence of the Chicago scene post COVID. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, so I, if anybody's listening to this, I'm always like so nervous to be interviewed. Cause I'm like, what if I sound dumb? I'm not like the most You're doing well great. You're doing fantastic. <laughs> You're doing fine. Everybody feels like this. You're doing awesome. Hell yeah. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I'm not like the, the most well-read person ever. So a lot of it was just kind of like internal transformation, uh, spearheaded by some like choice mushroom trips years ago. And so I had a, a project before Coco Joey that was like sort of accessing all of the darkest elements uh, within myself and sort of turning that, transmuting that into its own character. And it was like more of a darker sort of industrial thing. And I was reading a lot of this like horror fiction author slash um, pessimistic nihilistic philosopher Thomas Ligotti, which like nobody should look up based on me saying this because it was just like, a, I don't know, a bunch of depressing shit that I was reading a lot of and like, yeah, but it's uh, important to you. So who gives a shit? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, I, I mean, like, it kind of, like, fucked up my mental health reading this. Um, and so I wrote a song that was kind of inspired by him. It, like, never ended up coming out. But then just kind of, like, through COVID, having a lot of time to sit with myself and my thoughts and do internal work that, you know, maybe would have been done otherwise. But, like, you know, there's, like not much of anything else going on. So I could just kind of sit there and be in my head and experiencing pieces of media that were kind of shifting my, um, my perspective. And uh, one of those was uh, Be Here Now by Ram Das and reading the, the lecture in there. And there was a, a space that I would go to. I had to go back to live with my parents for a little while in 2020. And there was like a small nature preserve close to uh, my childhood house. And so I would go there and just like sit and like meditate and hang out. And I was reading Be Here Now and there was a page that was like literally the same lyrics to the chorus of the song that I had written that was inspired by Thomas Ligotti. So it was like, in a way, kind of the same sort of like existential track, but like just from a completely different frame of mind, like in a matter of a few words, like, you know, if everything is devoid of meaning, that just creates a void within which that you can put your own meaning into it, you know, rather than like, surrender to the meaninglessness which was kind of my approach before so i just kind of had like a aha moment there and then like in that space in that nature preserve where i would meditate i would feel and i feel like honestly i i am so lucky that i can say this i feel like moments in covid were like the height of like the best mental health that i've ever had just like meditating more than ever and just like being in nature more than ever i was lucky that i am a teacher I teach piano lessons and like a lot of my lessons could go on zoom so like i still had that going for me and was just spending a lot of time sitting and doing that and there was a moment in that nature preserve where there were like a family of foxes that were like kind of running around like there was like deer over there and stuff and i was meditating and the foxes were like 20 feet away like i kid you not and there were these two fox kits like playing and i was just like sitting there and just like you know totally sober, but just like completely tripping out. Like, oh my God, like I am one with nature right now. And um, just kind of like hung, it was like this amazing moment. And then of course, of course I was like, okay, I gotta get a picture of this. So I like pulled out my phone and like the moment that my phone entered the picture, it just like cut it and they like ran away. And then like the moment was over, but just kind of experiences like that. And then realizing like the music that I had been writing, you know, was just, just putting so much darkness out into the world, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, especially when it's like, you know, feelings that can be cathartic or relatable to people. But for myself, I was like, I just want to put out, you know, positive messages and positive energy and realizing that I didn't necessarily have to like change my entire philosophy internally to do that and just sort of change my perspective, which also coincided with like, you know, the therapy I was in at the time. And so then it took a couple of years of just sort of like processing and figuring out where I wanted to to take it. And the Coco Joey stuff started out as kind of like a, a joke side project. A friend of mine, we talked about like making a fake label with like fake projects and it was just kind of all us. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna make like funny, you know, like Porter Robinson meets Machine Girl type tracks, which is like the, the first like couple of like proto Coco Joey, proto Joey, oh God. Um, yeah. I was I saw him moving around back there, and I knew that he was gonna get noticed at some point. Everyone say hi to Wyatt. Hi. He's the reason I get views. Oh, Wyatt. Um, he's my special little guy. Oh, maybe maybe we'll see Coco around here. He's always in his spot, looking out the window back there. What was I saying? Yeah. So just like this record kind of came out of nowhere. I wrote it in most of it in a few months, and it felt very true to where I was at the time and where I want to be. And I feel like everything I've made in my life, there's been like a statute of limitations for like me being proud of it, like a couple of years past. And then I'm just like, oh, that sucks. Like, but this is like what I'm making right now is where it's at. And then like a couple of years later, I'm like, oh, that I didn't know what I was doing back then. Um, which I think that's is just maybe- the art, That's the whole artist thing in the first place. Like you'd never I, like what you first put out. Right. So I guess that it comes with like finding your voice as well. Um, but now with this record, like I'm still really proud of it. Um, I'm still playing a lot of the music live as I work on my next record. What I love so much about the record, Coco Joey's World, the record that you put out in 2022. I'm a big uh, Danny L. Harl fan. 
specifically oh, yeah. Harlcore. Yeah, like Harlcore is like one of the albums that got me into electronic music in the first place. Your album and Harlcore have like a very similar thing where like it's not necessarily like telling a story, but it is very like you it's right in the name, Coco Joey's World. It's building this world like you can feel like a certain like alien vibe coming around the entire album where like it's a bunch of sh like it's a bunch of different stuff but it all comes to this one cohesive mood where you fe it it feels transportative honestly like it feels like it, it kind of like the best way i could describe it would be like if you it's like psychonauts where like it's just kind of jumping into your brain to a certain extent yeah oh my god i haven't thought about that game in so long <laughs> it's so good um yeah that means a lot that that would be your takeaway from it. I feel like my, just the way that like my creative inspiration works, I can, I feel like, like I can never like stick with one idea or just like do one sound or like one thing here. But my hope is that because it all comes from the same place of intentionality that it still feels cohesive in a way, even though, like you said, it kind of jumps from one place to the next. And uh, Danielle Harrell, definitely a huge inspiration as far as production approach and sound design. Um, and also, you know, being a, classical composer defector into the world of electronic music so classical composer to hyper pop pipeline exactly we keep bringing up video games going through this like we brought up psychonauts we brought up tony hawk and everything i know that the sample there's a punch sample that's in deep power that i know comes from a video game it's like that type thing and first of all i want to know what that sample is but second of all i need i'm just interested in like create it like how you go about like seeking out samples for songs and if like the idea of the sample comes first or if the like full song is created and then you have an idea per when you're in the process of producing it you think of the sample idea and then that comes in mm -hmm. yeah so it's funny that you say that so don't think there's a punch sample in deep power but there's like certain synth sounds that through the sound design process i was like oh this sounds very much like reminiscent of like a or like there's like what sounds like a dog barking which is like another synth sound that i made so um so you're I, I making those synth sounds yeah I, like I you're do great. how does that work i i open up serum and fuck around for an hour and then something <laughs> happens that's a bad question because it's too it's way too open-ended we'll we'll come back to that at some point yeah but i do i do some sampling for sure the primary like video game sample is from gauntlet dark legacy the announcer Sumner, like the voice is like toxic obstruction is like kind of piecing together, like when he's like calling out like names of different stages and stuff. And for sampling, I guess like I, I wouldn't consider myself really like a sample based artist because I just come from composing and like writing piano music first. So I feel like the songs always come first and then sometimes I'll just like hear something and it'll just be like, oh my God, that would be a sick sample. And then I just kind of mess around with it. But I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the like the genesis of a song for me. It's more of like, a, I am like, oh, pin this thing. This would be a cool sample. And then I'm writing something and I'm like, oh, like, here's the moment. And then that's how that, uh, that comes to pass. That's like, you talked about Toxic Obstruction just now. I have a question about that song. I need to know there's like the particular way that the screams come through on the verses. Mm -hmm. I need to know how that sound was created because it sounds like you're like screaming into like a vocoder or like it sounds like it's going through a tube or something like that. I usually am not like this in depth on production type stuff, but I need to know how that scream <laughs> was I, accomplished. I mean, this is my favorite thing to talk about. So I, I appreciate it. Perfect. The Fantastic. Interest. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess it's been a couple of years now since I recorded it. I'm trying to remember a lot of the vocals on Coco Joey's world are like really layered. My goal was to not necessarily have them sound like, you know, a chorus of voices, but just have them so layered that they got kind of like alien larger than life. So for the toxic obstruction versus it's like many layers of me doing kind of sort of like an amalgamation of like my version of a pig squeal and then a lot of the layers are kind of formant shifted and pitch shifted around so there's like a primary layer that's like less affected and then a lot of the like doubles are you know like either the formant is brought way down or like the pitch is brought way down and so it kind of creates this like monstrous gurgly there's no vocoder on it if i remember correctly but it's definitely kind of like a similar 
sound world for sure. Like it, it stuck out to me so specifically. Oh, cool. it, like I can't think of like I can't think of how to describe it, but it just sounds like it sounds like you're going through like a Jetsons tube or like those moments in like Sonic where you're like being just launched through like a pipe or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, there's something like concave and trapped about it where it feels like something is trying to like escape, and it's it's the coolest shit ever. Thanks. Yeah, actually, something I should have said before, and as far as like writing this music is a lot of my compositional process relies on the question, like, does this make me laugh? And if it does make me laugh, then it can go in the music. And if it doesn't, then I'm like, I can figure something else out that's like, you know, makes me laugh. It's not that it has to be like a joke necessarily, but like, you know, something with, with good humor. And so I think for me, I, I, I find the like sucking a soda through a straw, like grind vocals to be really funny. And so I totally. think that's- I'm hearkening to there. Your most recent song that you put out is Season of the Hunt, uh, which came out late last year. That song in particular is a lot more house influenced than mm -hmm. anything else that I'd heard you produce. And I know you say that you don't like to like stick to like one side of everything, but is there going to be a more like heavy leaning into house type sounds going forward in the new album that's coming out? Or that's being worked uh, on? No, no, that was definitely kind of like a one-off. The genesis of that song was just like me diving into like the fashion souls, like online community and just like wondering like if there was a fashion souls, like fashion show, like what could the music be to that? And I was also just like, I'm pretty sure that like the song Good Puss by Cobra was just like on repeat uh, in my car while I was starting to work on that song. So just kind of like, you know, the sort of the, the dark beats with the sort of like, you know, soft vocals over top, like spoken. And so then again, making me laugh, I thought it would be really funny if I just made all the lyrics about Bloodborne lore. Cause I was also playing through Bloodborne again at the time. So the night of the hunt being, you know, it's the hunt. And then just all the lyrics are, are Bloodborne references. And then, you know, wouldn't it be funny to do a Bloodborne line dance? So there's a moment in the bridge of the song where I, lead a dance and if uh, you come to a show where i'm playing that song i try to get the crowd to do the dance joey thank you so much for coming up on this episode where can we find oh, you for having me i really appreciate it you can find me i'm on all of the accursed social media platforms i'm on instagram i'm on tiktok i'm on twitter i guess those are the best places i'm not really on facebook anymore i feel like folks have rightfully left Facebook. Yeah. You can find links to everywhere. You can find Coco Joey in the description of this video. You can also find my link tree in the description of this video that will help you find all of my social media accounts as well as both video and audio versions of the very podcast that you're watching right now. If you like the podcast and you want to see more, make sure to subscribe on all video and audio platforms. Make sure to like and make sure to comment. The logo for the Cuddle Punk podcast is done by Lauren Young. You can find her Instagram in the description below. The theme song for the Cuddle Punk podcast is Lose a Turn by Modify. You can find links to all of her stuff in the description below. Make sure to check out the Cuddle Punk podcast on Patreon. Coco Joey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.